All right, so growth and decay stuff is kind of like the application of exponents and logarithm stuff. And because of that, I mean, if they weren't complicated enough already, there's a lot of reading involved. But what's good is they give us the formulas, kind of. So let's take a look. All right, you guys ready for us to read now? <laughs> Here we go. Earthquakes are complicated events. Thank you. And so the intent here is not to provide a complete discussion on the science involved in them. I think I said that already, right? We're not really looking at the details of earthquakes. We really just want that equation, but let's let's read just cuz that's one of our problem-solving techniques. Rather, we will look at a simplified version of the Richter scale. Has anyone, has everyone heard of the Richter scale? Yes. Okay. Now you can be familiar with it. The Richter scale measures the magnitude of an earthquake by comparing the amplitude of the seismic waves of the given earthquake to those of a magnitude zero event. I don't know what that means, but I assume it means something to someone. Which was chosen to be a seismograph reading of 0 0.001 millimeters recorded on a seismometer 100 kilometers from the earthquake's epicenter. Specifically, the magnitude of an earthquake is given by this formula or function or equation, whatever you want to call it. X is the seismograph reading in millimeters of the earthquake recorded 100 kil kil kilometers from the epicenter. Sorry, reading's not my specialty. So in this equation, it's just kind of, it may be helpful to remember that x, right, we should define these. x is the reading of the seismograph. That's the word. I know that's spelled wrong, but I don't care. So, x is the reading of the seismograph, and m of x would be the reading on the Richter graph or scale, whatever. All right? So they're going to do one of two things. They're going to give us the Richter reading, or they're going to give us the seismograph reading in millimeters. And based on those two, whichever one it gives us, we've got to solve for the other one. So we're just going to use all the properties of logs and exponents to do that. If it gives us the Richter reading, the nice thing about that is we can just, I'm, I apologize, I said Richter. I, I meant seismograph reading, which is in the equation anyways, right here. We can just replace that x value and then plug that directly into the calculator. But if it gives us the Richter reading, then we have to go into the exponent, exponential stuff. So you'll see. All right, here's our first problem. Given the formula M, I guess that would be magnitude, of the Richter reading equals log of, and that would be the common log, of X over 0 0.001. Compute the magnitude of an earthquake with a seismograph reading of 40,000 millimeters, and we'll round our answer to the nearest tenth, which means we will need to use the calculator one way or the other. So in the formula, m of x equals log of x over 0 0.001. <clears throat> Are we replacing m of x or just x? Just x. And again, that goes back to that last slide. That is because x is the seismograph reading, which is what it gave us right, right here. So. I'm just going to plug that in, 40,000 right there, which I can, I guess I could replace the X there too with 40,000. That's a little sloppy, but the magnitude of a 40,000 reading on the seismograph would equal, and I'm just plugging this directly into the calculator, log of 40,000.001. And this is what I get. Round to the nearest tenth. That is the tenth. 
So, and I suppose you guys have heard this on the news. If you've ever heard of an earthquake on the news, they'll usually say what the reading was on the Richter scale. I guess that's the basis of how they find these. I could be wrong, and frankly, I don't care if I am or not, because we got it right, so... All right, this one is extremely wordy, and we got two different earthquakes. Let's read it. The 1906 San Francisco earthquake had a magnitude of 8.3 on the Richter scale. At the same time, in South America, there was an earthquake with magnitude 5.7 that caused only minor damage. How many times more intense was the San Francisco earthquake than the South American one? And we will round our answer to the nearest hundredth. So we're looking at one and asking, how much bigger is one than the other? Well, what that means also is that we can't compare the Richter readings. Because intuitively, we would say, well, 8.3, how much bigger is that than 5.7? That would compare the two earthquakes, but only on the Richter reading. That's not what we want. What we want to compare is how much bigger was one than the other, on the seismograph. Now we don't have the seismograph reading though, right? So we've got to figure that out. So let's look first at San Francisco. I hear that's a nice place. Is it? I hear they make good sandwiches. I like sandwiches. All right, San Francisco. It had an 8.3 Richter reading. So let's look at the formula or the function, I should say. m of x equals log of x over 0 0.001. Sorry, that got a little sloppy. So 8.3 is the Richter reading. So we're going to replace either the x or the m of x. M, m of x, right? Because that is the Richter reading. So I'm going to get rid of this garbage and replace it with the reading that we found 8.3 for San Francisco. Now this, hopefully, and this is where we kind of get mixed up, is because of all the words, we now have several different things going through our brains, but we've got to focus on one at a time. So if I just, if I just shown you this, this equation right here and said, hey, solve for x, what would you do? I mean, it's just like the ones we just did, though, right? So we can change this into an exponential form. So let's look first at what the, this common log is telling us. We got 8.3 would be, what would be the base of that log? 10, Ten very good, because that is the common log. And then we still have that x over 0 0.001. Okay. Now, some of you may skip this step again because you know that that's the common log and it has a base 10. So if I change this now into exponential form, I would have what? 10 log to 10 to the power of 8.3. Very good. 10 to the power of 8.3 equals what? X over 0 0.001. So if I wanted to solve for X, what would I do? There you go. I need to take both sides and multiply by 0 0.001. Uh oh. 0 0.001. So these cancel out, and I'm left with just x, which is what we wanted. And I can plug all of this stuff into my calculator right now. So if you did 10 to the power of 8.3 first, that's okay. Uh, you would just have a big number to plug into your calculator now. So either way you do it, you should get the same answer there. What do I get? 0 0.001 times 10 to the power of 8.3. It's a big number. Big number. Yeah. On the Richter, on this, this is a seismograph, I apologize. 
99,526. And I rounded that to the nearest whole value, right? If you want decimals, that's fine. So that is for San Francisco. Not only do we need to know San Francisco's seismograph reading, that seems improper, but whatever. We also need that South American one as well, right? So let's look back at the problem. So let's look at the South American one. South America, which is long words, so I'm not going to write out all the letters. Uh, once again, we want to find the seismograph reading. So I've got M of X equals log of X over 0 0.001. <clears throat> now, once again, it gave us the Richter reading, so we're going to replace M of X with the reading that it gave us, 5.7. I don't know if that's considered big or not. It sounds big, I guess, but let's find out. So we're going to do this. We're going to solve for this seismograph reading the same exact way that we did the other one. So let's look at this one in its true logarithm format. I'll separate these. Is that more sloppy? I don't know. If it is, I apologize. So we got 5.7 equals the log with a base 10, because that's a common log of x over 0 0.001. That's a better 5. And if we change this into exponential form, we have 10 to the power of 5.7 equals x over 0 0.001. And if we want to solve for x, same thing we did on the last one, we'd multiply both sides by 0 0.001 times 0 0.001. And these cancel out, and we have just x equals in the calculator. 5. What was it? Zero one. Zero one. Oh, so you had some decimals on that. Oh, that seems a lot smaller, right? Let's find out how exactly how much smaller it is. So how much bigger is the San Francisco quake than the South American one? Let's look. So what we're really asking is how many of these 5.01, 501, 501.82, how many of those are in this 199,000 and some change? So how would we do that? Divide. Divide. Very good. So we got the bigger earthquake reading, and we'll divide it by the smaller one, which was 501.82, and that will tell us exactly, I guess approximately because we're using that decimal, both decimals. That will tell us how much bigger one is than the other. So I got that divided by 501.82, 397-ish. So this would give us about 397. Now if you're off by one or two, that's okay. It just means you're rounding differently, all right? I mean, maybe you're off by five. Again, that goes back to the rounding stuff. So the answer would be expressed as 397 times bigger. The San Francisco earthquake was 300, about 397 times bigger. Yeah, it's um, how many times more bigger? So you could use subtraction, though. You could take that. 199,526 and subtract 501.2-ish and see how many times you would subtract that to get zero, I guess. Um, the shortcut to that is just to divide. So. And again, that, that has to do with how many times bigger it was. If it asks how much bigger it was, I mean, both answers would work 
398 times bigger, 397, or 199,000-ish more millimeters? It all depends on how you express the answer on that. That's a great question there. Well, that does it with earthquakes, which everyone uses in their lives. And now we're going to go to population. Uh, exponential growth has a general growth pattern of y equals a times b to the power of x. Previously, we looked at the formula for compound interest, right? Principle would be the a, and the base would be that 1 plus the rate. So for yeah. yeah, we don't expect you guys to derive these. I don't know if I could either right now, so... Yes, we should be pretty good. Which is an example of exponential growth? And if it's, not to make you depressed, but if you're in debt, then it's minus. I think, maybe I have that backwards, whatever. Population growth is also an example of exponential growth, but is often modeled with a function in which B is E. Specifically, population growth is given by this function. P of T equals P base, I guess it's sub value zero, times E to the power of R times T, where P sub zero represents the initial population, R is the growth rate or growth constant, and P is time and years. So let's take a closer look at these. Sorry, um, that is an R. And that's a T. You know what? We can get rid of it. And we will write it ourselves so that it looks a little bit better. R times T. Maybe that helps or not. I don't know. All right. So this P of T stuff right here in red, I have in red, that is the future population value. And again, P sub value zero. The zero just is to help us understand that it's the first, or it's the starting value, I should say. Okay? So if I said P of one, that would be the next value, P sub one. Maybe after a year or something like that. You don't have to memorize that, but this would be... I like the word initial value or starting value. You know what? Starting is a smaller word. Starting value. Specifically for population. Starting population value. And the T is the time in years. And the R, uh, there should be some kind of growth rate associated with this percentage value. So this is the growth rate. Growth or decay rate, I should say. But right now we're, we're talking about population growth. So if they give us the starting population value and the growth rate in the time of years, time in years, Finding the future population is pretty easy. We just replace all those values in this formula, plug and chug, put in the calculator, it gives us the answer. Otherwise, we may have to use logarithm type uh, properties to solve these. But since we're so experienced with those, no problems at all. So we have this formula, P of T equals P sub zero times E to the power of RT. Let's read the problem. The population of the world in 1987 was 5 billion, and the relative growth rate was estimated at 2% per year. Assuming that the world population follows an exponential growth model, find the projected world population in 2000. Round your answer to two decimal places. So are we looking for... I sh let me rephrase that question. What is the value we're looking for?
sorry. Yeah, P of T, because we want a future value here. They've given us a starting value to work with, which would be the 5 billion. Okay? So in other words, that's our P sub 0. Uh, what other information did it give us? Excellent. Growth rate, 2% per year, which would be 0 0.02 is the rate. What else? So we have... You could, right? So we got the rate. So how much time is... Are we looking at... 13 years. So that is excellent. We're looking for the year 2000, and our starting value was from 1987. So, yep, 13 years. And that is our T value. And that will allow us to solve for the future value, P of T. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and plug all the values we have into this, and we'll write it out. So it's not going to matter if you use scientific notation for the 5 billion. The actual number, 5 with 9 zeros, I think that's right, yeah, thank you. And, uh, or if you j just use 5. You just have to remember that the answer is going to be in context of however you put that number in, okay? So what number do you guys want me to use? Five, five billion, or five? Okay. So since I'm using five here, that means that my answer will be in billions already. Uh, if that doesn't make sense, hopefully it will. So e to the power of the rate, which is 0 0.02, and the time in years is 13 years. Well, I can plug that all into my calculator directly, which would give me the future value of the population. Now it's important to remember on the calculators, some of you may have to put this in parentheses as well. Okay? Or you can do that calculation first. 13 times 0 0.02, which would be 0 0.26, and just use that number. Any of those work. And the value that I get for all of this is 6.48 and some change. Now, that doesn't mean that the population in 2000 will be 6.48 people, right? Because our context, the five, was in billions. That means that this one also was in billions. I don't know. Do I need the S on there? Whatever. Now remember on this problem, if you had written 6480000, if you had written this out, you'd still be fine. If you'd written exactly what you put it, had on your calculator, because I had 64846504 and some more stuff, that would be fine as well. It's just a little bit more accurate. So Here is a new problem with two parts. So again, don't overload yourself. Let's do this one part at a time. The fox population, was, which is crucial, okay, in a certain region has a continuous growth rate of 5% per year. Listen, I know you guys are out there counting all the foxes, <laughs> finding out their f future values, all right? 5% per year. It is estimated that the population in the year 2010 was 14,600. Can you eat a fox? I do. Yeah. Seems like you can eat anything. I saw National Geographic, they eat monkeys in some places. Mm -hmm. I think that's in Peru. Is it in Peru? I have no idea. I just, I was just kind of surprised. Because wouldn't that be kind of like eating a human? No, Peru eats guinea pigs. Guinea pigs? Oh, okay. No, that's fine. I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. Sorry about that. Find a function that models the population T years after 2010. So uh, the function on this one, it's just going to look pretty much just like this one. 
all right? So we're still going to have that P of T, which is the future Fox population value. The initial population starting in 2010 is that 14,600. So let me just write this whole thing out first, and then we'll replace them as we go. So we're replacing the initial population value. Oh, I should have given myself more space. 14,600. And do we know the rate? 5%. Yeah, 5%. So I'm going to replace the rate now with that 5% as a decimal, 0 0.05. And I would be okay leaving it like this. I suppose if they wanted to be really picky. Let me see. Um, yeah. I think technically we could replace the T with the year minus 2010. But whatever, okay? So there is a... See, that wasn't too bad. We didn't even have to calculate anything except changing the percent to a decimal. Well, now that we have this, we can look at the question B, use the function from, use that function, to estimate the Fox population in the year 2015. So in this, in this function, P of T equals 14,600, E to the power of 0 0.05 T, we only have two two values that we can replace, either P of T or T. And which one are we replacing? T, right? So we're going to replace the years with how many years? There you go. So P of 5 will look something like this, which again, I can put directly into my calculator. I have a 5. And just for formatting purposes in the calculators, you may want to either do that first or put it in parentheses. So what do I get? This is what I have. I mean, if you want to label, that's fine. Foxes. All right, now we get even deeper into your lives by going into the half-life of certain substances. Certainly, let's read this, certainly, naturally, or certain, yeah, sorry, <laughs> certain naturally radioactive isotopes are unstable and change over time, which every, that's common knowledge. This change is called radioactive decay. One of the common terms associated with radioactive decay is half-life, which is the time it takes for half the substance to decay. The general growth equation, y equals a times b to the power of x, which we've seen, is also used when growth goes backward or decays. Half-life is found by solving for half of the remaining original amount when y equals one-half a. So the half-life decay equation becomes one-half a equals a times b to the power of x. However, in scientific texts, b is commonly replaced with e. Specifically, radioactive decay is given by this formula, or function, whatever, where r is the rate of decay and t is the time in years. So what this really comes out to is the population stuff. So that's why I have this up here, okay? The A represents the amount that you start with. Does that make sense in that right there? Let's take a closer look. Right there, right? The thing about this is we already know that in so many years, it's going to be a half of the original whatever we started with. And that's where that one-half comes from. So the future value, which would be P of T, is just going to be half of whatever we started. And then we have a certain number of years. 
What we don't have and what we won't have in these problems is the rate, which is what we're going to have to solve for, okay? Oh, yeah, that other one on that slide was that uh, I had the weight. I think it should be M, but I don't really care if it's mass or weight, so the weight is the initial weight times e to the power of the rate times the time. So the one I'm going to be using will probably look more like this. Because I'm assuming it's weight, not mass. So the rate in this one is represented by the letter k. Would you guys rather see that as an r? Because it doesn't matter. It's just the rate. They use k because it's a constant rate of exponential decay. All right. Well, whatever. Let's read this one. The half-life of radium, 226, which everyone has in their homes, is 1590 years. It's a long time. If a sample contains 300 milligrams, how many milligrams will remain after 2,000 years? Give your answer accurate to two decimal places. Okay, that's what we'll do. So again, I'm going to use that formula up there. Um, since 2,000 years isn't exactly half, we're going to have to find that, that rate, or the k. Let's plug everything in that we do know, that we do know though, okay? So, <clears throat> um, if you guys watch the other YouTube video, I do this a little bit differently, okay? But I, want, I just worry that it may be kind of confusing. So let's look at this a uh, different way which is this way. All right, so we're going to solve for that rate, which is k. <clears throat> and the initial weight that we're going to be using is, yeah, we'll use the 300. Now, we don't have to use 300, though, to find the rate. We can use whatever weight that we want. That doesn't have to make sense, but it is on the other video. The reason I say that is because if I wanted to start with one gram, or one kilogram, it wouldn't matter. I could put a one there and it would still be fine, just as long as I know what half of it is. Okay, so let's use that 300. And uh, in half the life of that, in the, after, after its half life, how much will be left? 125, that's the future value or the future weight. So I'm gonna replace that with that 150. Is that okay right there? Now, do we know how much time it takes to get to that half weight? Sorry? Um, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. It just is that uh, 1590 right there. So the time, I, I, I am going to go in there and replace that with that 1590. 1590. And now I just got to solve for K. All right. So when we solve for K, we got to get the E by itself. So the first thing I'm going to do is divide both sides by 300. And behold, we see that it's... You could use the decimal if you want, but I have one half. 150 divided by 300. And this will equal, now, e to the power of k times that 1590. So, I'm sorry? That is correct. So, if I change this to a logarithm format, then what would I have? Are we doing a common log? Just regular logs. So I have a logarithm. What would be the base? The base is e of one half, and that would equal times the fifteen ninety, right? So if we were to get to solve this, and by the way, I'm going to throw in an extra step just real quick. The log base E, I can change that format right there. The log base E is actually the natural log. So I can write this 
like that. Now, you didn't have to do that, but it may save us some time, okay? So how do I solve for k in this equation? There you go. I'm going to divide both of these by 1590. So the reason I want that natural log is so I can plug that directly into the calculator. The natural log of 1 half divided by 1590. Again, these cancel out. I got this wonderful value of negative 0 0.000. 436. All right, here is what you will be disposed to do, but is what you should not do. This is not the answer. <laughs> this is just to help us find the actual answer, right? Yeah, but it does help. It does help. So now that we know what the rate is, we should be able to figure out how many, how many years it takes I'm sorry, how much, how much will remain after 2,000 years? Because what we did is figured out the rate for that half-life in 1,590 years. All right, everyone's good on that then? Well, let's finish this problem then. So, uh, let's go back to the formula on this. We've got the future weight of uh, T. All right. <clears throat> now that we have that, um, this one says that we start with 300 milligrams, so that's what we're going to start with again. 300 milligrams. And I'm sorry, I put R, but I meant K, which we will replace as well. So that is the rate or the growth constant. <clears throat> and I'm going to replace the years now with the 2,000. Yeah. So my time now is in years. <clears throat> it would be 2,000 years. And I know that's a little sloppy, but all that stuff, the blue and the purple there are the power of E. So that will tell me the future value, which again would have been 2,000. So if we made this look a little bit cleaner. We have the future weight for the year for 2,000 years would be, yeah, I'm just putting this directly into my calculator, 300 times e to the power of that stuff times. 2,000 is what I get. Wait a second. 125.45 milligrams. So after 2,000 years, if we had a 300 milligram sample, all that would be left would be 125.45 milligrams. There we go. By the way, we may expect this too because... It should be cut in half after 1,590 years. This is more than that. And we can see that 125 is more than half of what would be there. I said more than half. I meant less than half. A wooden artifact from an ancient tomb contains 45% of carbon-14 that is present in living trees. How long ago to the nearest year was the artifact made? The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. All right, this one gave us a percent, but that isn't the decay rate. That's just how much in percent will be left. So... Uh, we've got to solve for that, that decay constant first. Which is the rate. Which is the rate, yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and, again, we, we kind of get to choose. What, what weight should we start with right here? 
I suggest doing something along the lines of one. Does anyone know why? It will make it easier. So the reason why it makes it easier because if I'm looking at the half-life, and by the way, how much time will that take? For it to be very good. So the half-life takes that 5730. That's how many years it takes to, for that weight to be cut in half. Um, and how much of one unit would be left? Half, right? So we can go into the future weight right here and replace it with half. Uh-oh. That's better. One half. On the last one, we chose 300 milligrams, and then half of that was 150. And we ended up with e to the power of something is 150. Now, the reason why this is good as well is because that one, we don't need it there. Anything times one is itself. Or if we divide it by one on both sides, it wouldn't change anything right there. So just getting rid of it looks, eh, it looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. So we're going to use the exact same method that we did on the last one to solve for k, which was what? Natural log. So we got the natural log of... That one half, and we'll divide that. Well, that's before we divide. That would equal k times the time, 5,730. Now, I did skip a step. Instead of changing it into a regular logarithm, we went directly to natural log this time. Is that okay? So, to solve this one, we're going to divide both sides by the 5730. And that will tell us what k is, because these cancel out. And we have k equals, I'm just putting this directly into my calculator. <clears throat> I have negative 0 0.000121. Uh, I do have more decimal places, but that's all I'm going to write, because that's big enough. All right. Now that we know the rate at which this is decaying, now we can figure out how long ago this was made, which is the time in years. But this one is a little tricky because of the stinking words and how they worded it, the jerks. Let's take a look. So well, now we go into that same formula. We've got the future weight equals the initial weight times E to the power of k times t. See how I gave myself more space there? That's nice. So I'm going to go on and replace these. I know that the rate constant of decay would be negative 0 0.000121. And what is the initial weight? So let's read the problem again, okay, because this may be a little confusing. A wooden artifact from an ancient tomb contains 45% of the carbon-14 that is present in living trees. It said something about 45% here, right? What is it talking about? So 45% of the 14? Of the carbon-14, right? Now, that is that the future value? That's the present value, right? Which, since we're looking for the previous, like what, what, how much was there to, to begin with, that means that we are going to be replacing the future value with 45%, which we can do. So we're not comparing necessarily weights directly, but how much is left. Okay? Now we want to know it's... Uh, how much they started with. So since we're looking at percentages, what we have now is 45% of what remains. How much did they start with? Close. Say that again? 100%. That's right. They started 
And again, since this is good because we're estimating with 100%, which as a decimal is 1. Is everyone okay on that? The great thing about this 100% is we get to ignore that just like we did up here with that one right there. Well, now we have this equation, and we're solving for t instead of k. So what are we going to do? Well, if we change this into the natural log format, we have the natural log of 0 0.45 equals the exponent stuff, negative 0 0.000121 times the time. Well, since we're solving for time here, we're going to divide both sides by the decay rate, 0 0.000121, and we'll divide it by the other side as well to balance the equation and that gives us the amount of time it takes uh, I'm sorry how long ago it was so if I put this into my calculator the natural log 0.45 divided by this garbage and I get well I used all the decimals or my calculator did so 6,601. I know some of you guys put 6,600 years. Either one works. Again, it all depends on what number you're using for the constant. Okay? But both are acceptable. And they're, again, they're only different because of the rounding stuff. So, so I need to know what questions you have. Are you guys still thinking about your questions? Like, yes. So will it give us like the formulas and stuff? It will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't end up like those two over there on the table. <laughs> those two. Okay. The math got to those two, sorry. Here's, yeah, so it seems like one of the classes actually gave me this answer, 6,599, and that's okay too. Yeah, so uh, again, that just goes with how we're rounding those numbers. Oh, by the way, on that problem, the, the rate was 0, 0.0 negative 1 to 1, right? One to one, I think. Uh, don't round this to the tenth. Okay. Or the hundredths. We need some. We need some decimals in there. So, if you if that means you use scientific notation, then do it.